Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today's Brown Bag webinar. Uh, we will get started in just a moment. Let's go ahead and get started uh, just to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, it is 12.02. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Lisa Nolasco with the ACLU of Southern California. Uh, I, I mentioned thank you for coming to this webinar, Brown Bag Presentation. Uh, quick disclaimer, uh, this is being recorded uh, so that we can send a copy of this to uh, people that were not able to make today's presentation. Um, and that way it can be accessible for all folks. Uh, and it is also a webinar presentation, meaning you don't have the video capabilities or unmuting options, but we really encourage everybody to use the chat and Q&A functions to be engaged. Sorry, <laughs> I muted myself. Uh, to be engaged throughout the presentation, um, and I'll defer to Angelan when, when we open up the program about questions, um, and, and he will share a little bit more about that. Uh, and Grace, do you want to uh, share quickly about CLE credits? Yeah, for um, for any California attorneys who are participating, we will be providing uh, one and a half CLE credits. Um, in the chat box, I'll drop a link into a Google form um, for folks to sign up, and then that way I can get your information. I'll be able to send out certificates and evaluations. Um, one quick note for CLEs, um, it does, it, the evaluation will ask if you are provided written materials and Luis and I will be sending those out at a later date. So um, those will be coming to you soon. Um, but if you have any CLE questions, feel free to just drop it in the chat. Yes, and then that's a good, great point is we will send all that information. If you registered, do not worry, you will get a copy of the recording and you will get the information about CLE credits. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I have the pleasure to introduce Angelan today. Um, uh, Angelan uh, used to be a senior counsel at the ACU of Southern California, so we have that, I have the honor of presenting him. Um, and it feels a little strange because it's like a friendship, right, I'm choosing a friend. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So Angelan Arulanantham is a professor of practice and co-director of the Center for Immigration Law policy at the UCLA School of Law. He has successfully litigated a number of cases involving immigrant rights, including Franco Gonzalez v. Holder, the first case which established a federal right for appointed counsel in any group of immigrants, Jennings v. Rodriguez, which secured the due process rights of immigrants dealt for years while lit litigating their deportation cases, and most recently, Ramos v. Nielsen, a challenge to the Trump administration's plan to end the TPS program, that's the Temporary Protected Status Program, for immigrants who have lived here lawfully for decades. Angelan has argued twice before the United States Supreme Court and has testified before the United States Congress on three occasions. He's also served as a lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School and at the University School of Law 
University of Irvine School of Law, where she taught preventative detention. Uh, Angelan's parents are Sri Lankan Tamil immigrants who left Sri Lanka to escape race discrimination and sporadic violence. Several years after they came to this country, the Sri Lanka Civil War began, causing much of his extended family to flee Sri Lanka. Angelan has a, remained interested in promoting human rights in Sri Lanka and has represented several Sri Lankan Tamil refugees during the course of his work with the ACLU. Prior to joining UCLA, Ahlan was our senior counsel at the ACLU of Southern California, where she worked for nearly 20 years. Ahlan has also worked as an assistant federal public defender in El Paso and as a law clerk in the United Courts of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. In 2007 and 2013, he was named the California Lawyer Magazine's Lawyers of the Year for Immigrant Rights and has repeatedly been one of the Daily <coughs> Journal's top 100 lawyers in California over the past decade. In 2010, he received the Alter C. Helton Human Rights Award for the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and in 2014 received the Jack Wesserman Memorial Award for Litigation to protect the rights of vulnerable immigrants, also from the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And most recently, in 2016, Ackland was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. With that said, I'll open it up to Ackland. Thank you for being here with us today. Really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, my friend, Luis. It's always wonderful to be uh, introduced with you, uh, introduced by you and to, to spend some time together. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Searching for the North Star, my reflections on two decades of immigrant rights advocacy. Um, just one housekeeping bit that Luis had said I would talk about regarding uh, the questions or comments. I'm not going to be able to get to them during the presentation, but um, you know we have till 1.30, and there will be some time at the end for that. Um, I've been giving this talk for a few years now, mostly just to give some historical perspective on the struggles of the immigrants' rights movement that I've been a part of. Honestly, it was sort of cathartic, I think, to start giving this talk. Um, I use it as a chance to tell some stories from my life, from my work, and about my advocacy. Um, I've also at the end, and you'll see this again a little bit in the talk, tried to offer some reflections on where we go from here. Um, just a little bit uh, to hopefully plant some seeds in people's minds, uh, working through some of the same things that I'm thinking about. Um, but for now, you can just sit back and relax. There is no quiz. Uh, it's just, just a lot of stories. Um, and the stories start with my first advocacy campaign, which happened when I was nine years old. See, I'm the younger of two brothers, which means, um, you know, you live in the shadow of your brother, right? And when we were little kids, we shared a room and I wanted my own. So what did I do? I advocated for it. Um, here you can see me employing a really important tactic, trying to win this, the buy-in of an important stakeholder, my brother, by jumping on his back. Um, and it took a little while, but eventually it succeeded. And on my 10th birthday, which was in February of 1983, what used to be the study in my parents' home in Lancaster, California, became my room. Um, and so it was, it was a sweet victory but it was short-lived. You see, although I was born here, my family is from Sri Lanka. And as Louis said in the, um, in the introduction, we're Tamils. Um, that's an ethnic community which is dominant in Northeast Sri Lanka, but a minority in the rest of the island. Now, my parents had left Sri Lanka in 1970s because they faced race discrimination and occasionally sporadic violence, again, because of their race, targeted because of their race. You know, they didn't flee for their lives. I think it's important for people to understand, you know, they, there wasn't like there wasn't anybody pointing a gun at their head. But they did not believe that Sri Lanka would be a stable place to raise uh, the family that they hoped to have. And unfortunately, they were right. Um, July of 1983, five months after my 10th birthday, is known throughout the Tamil diaspora community as Black July. There were widespread pogroms throughout the island that 3,000 Tamil people were killed in racial violence um, by mobs, and then another 150,000 people were displaced into internal refugee camps. Many of my relatives were among that group who were displaced into those camps. And I still remember my parents telling us about it. You know, they gathered my brother and I together in our house in Lancaster. I remember I was sitting on the stairs and they said to us, there have been troubles in Sri Lanka. So our cousins, who we knew, um, they would be coming to stay with us. And they said, it might be for a few weeks, it might even be for a few months. Well, it turned out, in some cases, it was actually more like a few years, 
first about 15 people, um, my father's side relatives, staying in a house built for five. Um, and then after they eventually settled, many of them in the US, but actually other people all around the world, the war continued. And as the war continued, my parents took in more people fleeing from the conflict. First other relatives on my mother's side, then friends, then relatives of friends. And by the end, people who were basically strangers. And for about a decade, we had people staying in our house uh, from Sri Lanka. And this was actually very common in the Sri Lankan Tamil communities all around the world. Now, what did this mean for me? Well, it meant I lost my room, <laughs> the little bratty 10 year old. Uh, for, for six months uh, sleeping in my room, I was rewarded with two years sleeping on the floor of my parents' bedroom with my brother next to me. But what I gained was a window into the struggles of displaced people and displaced people living at all different stages of life. Here are three generations of um, my family on my father's side. You know, I got a firsthand look at the barriers of what it's like you know, from my cousins, some of whom are right around my age, who had to start anew going alongside me to public school in Lancaster, California, to the older ones whose college or early career plans just went up in smoke, literally. Um, to my grandmother, you see here, born a British subject in a village that had never even seen an automobile, who left Sri Lanka for the first time in her life flying on a plane to live out her final years, first in the US, and then in the United Kingdom with my uncle. 25 years later, we did a family reunion. This is all the, almost all the descendants of my grandmother. You know, as a family picture, it's not the greatest. Um, it's, it's a good example of the chaos that ensues when you try to take an Arlan and them extended family photo. Um, my favorite thing about this picture is my niece who's there in the blue dress in the front. She's caught red handed, annoying her cousin, like right as the, as the picture gets taken. But for other reasons, the picture turns out to be quite interesting. You see, most of the people in this picture, particularly pretty much everyone uh, back from the front rows, were born in Sri Lanka. But none of them at the time this picture was taken lived there. They immigrated to various countries around the world, some through asylum, others through other mechanisms, employment visas and things like that. In this picture, there are Americans, Canadians, Australians, Zimbabweans, and Brits. And of course, then there's others, more the younger people, uh, born outside of Sri Lanka. But let me ask you this question. Can you tell which ones are which? No, of course not. Of course not. Because they all seek the same thing everyone else does, just a stable life for themselves and for their children. And that understanding that no matter where you're born, these are the things you want, that has shaped all of my life's work from a very young age. Skip ahead now, <laughs> through law school, uh, clerked for a year. My first regular job was as a fellow at the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project from 2000 to 2002. And my project, as I was an Equal Justice Works fellow, was focused heavily on Sri Lankan Tamils who were trying to win asylum in the immigration courts in New York. In fact, it's hard to imagine today, but at that time, they were the second largest group after Chinese people seeking asylum in the New York and New Jersey area. And so if so you're paying attention to those dates, 2000 to 2002, you'll know then that yes, I was in New York in September, 2001. I was late to work on a train in the Grand Central Station tunnel when the second plane hit the World Trade Center. And I remember it. I remember it very, very well. I was literally in Grand Central Station when there was this mass hysteria of people who suddenly were running out of the station, fleeing the other way. And I ran too. <clears throat> I caught the last train back out of the city um, up into Connecticut. But as we crossed over the George Washington Bridge, I looked back and I saw this moment when one building was on fire burning and the other one was gone, just this huge cloud of smoke in its place. I spent the next week at my apartment in Connecticut because the ACLU offices, which are actually south of the World Trade Center, were completely closed. Um, the office servers were down, so there was no computers. So the Immigrants' Rights Project staff connected to each other on our private Yahoo accounts. This is before Gmail. It had not been invented yet. 
And then within a week of the attack over my Yahoo account, I saw come in the first proposals for what would become the USA Patriot Act's immigration provisions. And they were extremely, extremely draconian. They would have given the attorney general authority just to indefinitely detain any immigrant with no procedural protections whatsoever. And I watched my supervisors still displaced from their offices start working to limit this threat to civil liberties. It was really a, a powerful experience, formative experience for me at that time. And actually they largely succeeded. You know, the Patriot Act detention provisions ended up far, far better than what was initially proposed. But weirdly, shortly after that, we started getting reports that the government was detaining people in a dragnet anyway. Nearly a thousand people, almost all non-citizens, were arrested on immigration charges just in the New York and New Jersey area in the first few months after the attacks. And since I was the fellow charged with uh, working with detained immigrants in, in from that office, it was my job to go talk to them. It was a huge fight just even to gain access into the detention center. They didn't want to let any lawyers in, but eventually they did. And I got to go in and over the course of a few in, uh, visits, I interviewed about a hundred of these people who had been detained in these immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And most of them were so horrified um, that they were stuck in this place that they just wanted to be deported. But the government was imprisoning them anyway, actually not letting them go even to be deported um, because they said that they were part of the 9-11 investigation. And it was an enormously diverse group of men who I met. Um, you know, they were sort of perceived Muslim um, was one thing that they had in common. <clears throat> um, but, you know, they were from all over the world. I, I knew people, I met people from Indonesia, all the way to Morocco, and sort of everywhere in between. I even met a man, I remember, he was from the Caribbean. Uh, his name was Ali. Um, but he said, you know, I'm from Trinidad. I eat pork. I drink. What are they even doing keeping me here? But what it turned out was, these people were part of a newly forming racial category, the kind of Muslim terrorist thing that we're still living with. And just as Asians and Latinos and other racial categories have been formed in part by the immigration laws, you know, creating legal categories to produce them, so too I realized this category was coming into existence now. And somewhat disturbingly, it occurred to me, I'm part of it. And of course, the other thing they had in common was that not a single one of them had anything whatsoever to do with the 9-11 attacks. A thousand people imprisoned, their lives really largely destroyed um, for no reason. That was not the first or the last dragnet discrimination program that we saw uh, during this era. And shortly after that, there was a voluntary interview program, which is really an interrogation program. It targeted 8,000 non-immigrants and then separately, once the drumbeat for war in Iraq came, about 10,000 Iraqis and Iraqi Americans. Then after that, there was the NSEERS, the National Security Entry Exit Res Registration Program, required the registration of 138,000 people from 25 countries, almost all Muslim majority, except for North Korea, in case that sounds familiar to any of you. 80,000 people were interviewed as part of that, 13,000 of them were put into deportation proceedings, but again, not a single one of these people in any of these dragnet programs had any connection to 9-11 or were even convicted of any terrorism related offense. Really what these were, they were Muslim registries, but for non-citizens. And so I think this is really important when we remember today, condemn the Muslim man, which President Biden got rid of on day one, um, it's really important to understand that the idea that our government would treat all people perceived Muslim as threatening, it didn't start with President Trump. It was there 20 years ago. And it was the product of a bipartisan consensus. Sadly, that consensus continues to exist even to this day. And the Biden administration has continued to defend Bush era policies that involved dragnet surveillance against mostly immigrant Muslim communities including right here in Southern California. One of the cases that we have challenging that, FBI v. Fizaga is now headed to the Supreme Court with the Biden administration still defending the same positions of the Trump administration and the Obama administration and the Bush administration. 
defended on these subjects. Sometime in the fall, just a few weeks after the Patriot Act had passed, I went to a conference in Tucson of the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild. It was about the immigration issues of the time, expedited removal, detention, things like that. And of course, a lot of the focus was on, on what was happening in light of the 9-11 the attacks. Um, after the first day of the conference, a few of the younger attorneys there, which back then would have included me, um, we decided to go down a little bit south of Tucson to attend a border protest, a protest over the deaths of people crossing in the desert, just like today. Um, and afterwards, we decided to cross over into Nogales, Mexico, um, to have dinner and hang out for a little bit. Now, the world was so different back then with respect to the border. You could cross the border just with your driver's license. There was no Department of Homeland Security. In fact, the concept of the term homeland is a way to describe the United States. It hadn't even entered the lexicon yet. Nobody used that word. So we had some dinner and then some drinks. And then we had a couple more drinks and we were getting up, getting ready to go. When one of the people who was with me suddenly said, hey, I've got an idea. Rather than all going back together in a group, let's go back one at a time. And you, meaning me, why don't you go last? And let's see if you get stopped. You see, I was uh, the only non-white person in the group. And I thought about that and I was like, that's a great idea. We totally should do that. And so we did. People took bets actually before we went up on what would happen. I didn't bet because that would have been a conflict, um, but other people did. And we were all set to go. And actually right before we were going to get into line, my good friend, Matt Adams, who is the legal director now at the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project and one of the most important um, and brilliant immigrant, immigrants rights litigators in the country, he turned to me and he said, you know what? Why don't you go second to last? I'll go behind you just in case something happens. So people went up one by one into the line and then it was my turn and I went up and I said, you know, border patrol official, what are you doing here? Um, conference, Tucson, immigrants rights, blah, blah. The guy looks at me and he's like, go to secondary inspection, which is the place where they send people to be interrogated when they won't let you into the country. And another agent went with me, walked me off to the side, and I was actually standing just outside the room to be let into, uh, to be taken into the, the interrogation room at secondary inspection. And I could see across the room, Matt Adams, uh, who had come up behind me. And first I could see him talking to the guard. And then after that, I could see him pointing over, like, hey, that guy, he's with us. And you know, that guard came over and talked to the guard who was escorting me. And they chatted for a second, and then he looked at me and he was like, okay, you're free to go. With my one white witness vouching for me, I was allowed into the country. And the only thing I don't remember about that story is, is who won the bet. A few weeks before that, in October of 2001, there was another Sri Lankan Tamil man, also named Ahilan who also presented himself at a port of entry in San Diego, just a few hours west of Tucson. He was a little younger than me, 21 years old. He was a farmer from Jaffna. That's where my family is from in Northern Sri Lanka. But our lives had been quite different. Uh, he was born there, whereas I was born here. He had been tortured by the Sri Lankan army as a, growing up as a teenager and while he was there. It's a very, very common phenomenon in Northern Sri Lanka during that time. His brother had actually been killed during a military operation as a civilian um, when the army had uh, essentially invaded that part of the country. Um, but of course, unlike me, Nataraja not being a citizen, and when he came to the border, there was no one there who could vouch for his claim. Now he presented himself to the immigration authorities and they found his account of what had happened to him credible. And so they said he could see a judge to present that claim and ask for asylum. That right, by the way, to present your asylum claim was ended by the Trump administration ostensibly as a coronavirus prevention measure and has not yet been restored by the Biden administration. If you see in the news a discussion of Title 42, that's what they're talking about. Anyway, back then in October 2001, even just shortly after the 9-11 attacks, they had not suspended the right to asylum. Um, they told Ahilan that he could present his claim, but they said, if you want to present it, we will send you 
to an immigration prison while you wait for your day in court. And under our law, both then and now, refugees who come here and want to present their asylum claims are sent to immigration prisons to wait until their case comes up. And so he was sent to a place called the Otay Mesa Detention Center, just south of San Diego, to wait. I finished my conference and I went back to New York. And I spent the last year more or less primarily focused on 9-11 detainees, trying to help those people get out. I finished my time at the Immigrants Rights Project and decided I wanted to do some criminal defense work and that I wanted to see the border region. And so I went to El Paso, Texas, where I worked as a federal public defender for two years. It was totally fascinating. Um, then at the end of that time, I decided I wanted to come back to Los Angeles, to home, and also that I wanted to come back to the ACLU. And so I joined the ACLU of Southern California in June of 2004. And when I did that in June of 2004 and started my job here um, in, in LA at the ACLU of Southern California, Ahilan Nataraja was still locked up at the Otay Mesa Detention Center in San Diego. And as it turned out, that was the first case that I took when I got to the SoCal office. I poured my heart and soul into trying to get Ahilan out. You know, he had won in front of the immigration judge. The government had appealed his case to the Board of Immigration Appeals. They had sat on it for a long, long time and eventually sent it back for a new trial in front of the immigration judge. That's actually when I showed up. Um, we investigated his case even more to try and show that, um, that his claims were valid, that he was not any kind of national security threat. I even enlisted my family, actually my British cousin who had gone back to do relief work in Jaffna at that time, one of the people who had come as a, as a small child to live in our house. And he actually went into a Sri Lankan military high security zone to take a statement from Ahilan Nataraja's family. We presented his declaration in court, which caused serious problems for the court reporter, by the way, because he had to contend with the client, Ahilan Nataraja, the lawyer, me, Ahilan Arulanandam, and the investigator, Amalan Arulanandam. Needless to say, they're all mixed up in the transcript, which is not the first or the last time someone confused me for my client. Um, but with all this work being done, nonetheless, his case was still stuck in limbo. And finally, we filed a habeas petition, um, arguing that his detention was invalid. We lost that in the district court, which in turn sat on it for a long time. Um, for the lawyers following along, we actually filed a mandamus petition to force the district court to decide it. Eventually, we got to the Ninth Circuit. And finally, finally, after four and a half years of imprisonment for Ahilan Nataraja, we won his case. And the Ninth Circuit held that when examined under the analysis prescribed by the Supreme Court, Nataraja's detention is unreasonable, unjustified, and in violation of federal law. And we grant his motion for immediate release. I have to say, even now, a very long time, 15 years ago, I still remember that as one of the sweetest days in my life. We walked to the detention center, um, got him, walked him out of there, drove to Lancaster. A few of our family friends had arranged a little meal for him at uh, what was then uh, a Sri Lankan Tamil restaurant in Lancaster, it's no longer there. Had a lovely rice and curry meal. <laughs> I still remember at one point during the meal, Ahilan suddenly turned to me and he said, wait, is the moon out tonight? And I was like, yeah, I think it is. He was like, let's go outside. And we went outside and looked up and he said, oh my God, the moon is so beautiful. I haven't seen the moon in four years. But I have to tell you, it's not sort of all happy ending for Ahilan Nataraja. In some ways it is. He uh, lives in Southern California. He's a US citizen and he's a child. But I also think he struggles in a lot of ways. Um, once in an interview, he said, I lost my time and my life, and I almost lost my mind too. It's not fair that they put me in jail without a reason. You know, it's really hard to lose four and a half years, half of your 20s, being jailed for nothing. For me, Nataraja's case offered a window into a world of what I like to call the immigration prisons, or what author Mark Dow, and what I still think today is the best book ever written on immigration detention, uh, he, he calls the American Gulag. And I'd highly recommend this. It's, it's old now, but it, it's as though it could have been written yesterday. Um, <clears throat> the immigration 
law terminology, of course, is not prison. It's detention centers. And that's the term that you sort of use. It's what you even have to use some of the time when you're talking to reporters so they don't get confused. But the reality is that it is a highly, highly misleading term. Right? Detention is what happens to you after school if you've misbehaved in class. Um, in criminal procedure, for those who have taken that, <laughs> detention is meant to be a brief period when the police hold you with reasonable suspicion that you've committed a crime, but not so much that it rises to probable cause. If it, <clears throat> you get probable cause, then you can do more. You can actually go and arrest the person. What does that mean? It means you can hold them beyond just a few hours because detention is at most probably several hours. And once they move you from the site where they first encountered you to the police station, now you're in arrest and not just in detention. But of course, in immigration law, it means something entirely different. What does it really mean, immigration detention? It's a system of imprisonment without trial. And I use that term imprisonment literally. If you've ever been to an immigration detention center, people there wear jumpsuits. There are no contact visits for the most part with your family, which means you can't hug your children if you're in immigration detention. Guards patrol the floors. Most of them are run by private prison companies or county jails. Now, if you're not familiar uh, with the bizarre world of immigration law, you would ask, how is this possible under our law? And the answer is, it's built on a legal fiction. And one thing I would say to all the law students out there, you have to learn all the legal fictions in order to do well in your courses, but it's really important that you always remember that they are fictions. The fiction here is that deportation and detention, pending the deportation process, is not as serious as criminal sanction, and therefore is only a civil penalty rather than a criminal punishment. Because of that, because deportation is only civil rather than criminal, it means many of the most basic rights that attach to people in criminal proceedings, the right to ask a judge for release on bond, the right to an appointed lawyer if you can't afford one, do not apply in deportation cases. Even the judges, the judges can be hired and fired by the attorney general. Now, the historical origins of this modern immigration doctrine are also really important to understand. Arguably, the most foundational case coming from the Chinese exclusion era is Fang Yue Ting. It held that deportation is not a punishment and therefore can be accomplished without the protections afforded to criminal defendants, including the right to seek bail. Specifically, it upheld the one white witness rule, which you all may remember from my trip to Tucson, to prove that a Chinese person had lived here before their trip, if they had gone to, um, to visit their family and wanted to prove that they had the right to come back, they had to produce one white witness who would testify for them. Fang Yue Ting upholds that rule. Now it's old, it's from 1893. And it's important to think, what are the other cases that govern us that come from 1893? Not a whole lot. Bradwell v. State, from 1872 is part of the same Supreme Court era, the Fuller Court. It held that the Constitution permits states to ban women from practicing law. Plessy v. Ferguson, I'm sure many of you know that one, upholds separate but equal and gives the legal sanction to the Jim Crow era. That's three years after Fang Ting. But while cases like Bradwell and Plessy have been consigned to the dustbin of history, Fang Ting from the same era remains foundational to our immigration law. Now, although the legal justifications for the immigration prison system are very old, they date back, like I said, to the Chinese exclusion time, the massive system that we have today, the actual immigration prison gulag that Mark Dow references is not. In fact, it's an entirely modern phenomena. It was dramatically expanded in 1996 with the passage of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act by, signed by President Clinton. That dramatically expanded the grounds on which people could be deported, particularly for crimes, making it possible to deport people for misdemeanors, for petty thefts, for simple drug possession. Also, the classes of people who were to be put into immigration jail while their cases were pending, while they fought their cases, also dramatically expanded under this law, including, most importantly, for our purposes, the, for I mean, Ahila Nadarja's story, the, the provisions permitting people to be detained as asylum seekers. Now, what did this law do to the deportation numbers? Well, send them through the roof. Here's a chart of deportations per year 
and look at that chart from 1996, how much it jumps. 1995, 56,000 people were deported. Then that law, our IRA is enacted. And over the next eight years, in Clinton's, all of, all of President Clinton's eight years, 870,000 people are deported. Then under George W. Bush, which is the first time you get eight full years of the new regime, 2 million people are deported. And then under President Obama, which lasts a little bit longer than this chart here, 3.2 million people. 3.2 million people deported under the Obama administration. And to give you some historical context, in the first 100 years of immigration law, from 1892 to 1997, only 2 million people were deported. Correspondingly, you'd think, oh, they must have hugely increased under President Trump. But no, <clears throat> in fact, they did not. Even before the pandemic, deportations decreased under President Trump, um, largely due to the rise of blue state sanctuary city policies. And I won't get into this in great detail, but because states like California um, and New York and others in, at different levels in California with state legislation um, enacted laws that made it uh, hard or in some cases impossible for their state and local officials to cooperate with federal immigration enforcement, the total number of deportations actually decreased during that time. However, the number of people in immigration detention being held on any given day did not. It continued to go up even under Trump. And here you can see it sort of tracks again that increase from the 1990s, about 5,000 people on any given day in 1994. Then you get the law. And by 2001, it's 19,000 people who will go to sleep that night in an immigration prison. Then in 2014, skip ahead 13 years, and the numbers ballooning again, going up and up with just a small dip, 34,000 people in 2014. In February of 2019, that number actually exceeds 50,000. Um, and it ends up actually passing that number at an all time high um, until coronavirus comes, which I'll get to later on. Now, these numbers are great. They tell you a horrible story, but of course, we know numbers are not enough. What we need to understand is the people who are imprisoned in these places. Who are they? I'll have you meet some of them. Here we see my lovely friends, Raymond Soweth in the middle, his wife, Cindy, uh, to his right, and Amadou Jouf. For those of you who practice, who know about Jouf hearings, uh, bond hearings under 1231A6, that's Amadou Jouf. So I mentioned earlier, there are asylum seekers who are detained, people like Nataraja kept in the immigration jails, but there's other people here who have had some kind of lawful temporary status. And then the government claims that they have violated the terms of their visas. And if they resist that and they want to contest that in front of an immigration court, they can, but they get sent to immigration prison. Raymond Soweth was a Christian minister from Indonesia. Uh, he's of perceived Chinese descent, I think is the best way to explain it. It's perceived as ethnically diff different from um, native Indonesians. He enters on a valid visa. Then he seeks asylum after there's a spate of violence against his community of um, Chinese Christian Indonesians. Um, and that happened while he was here. So he can litigate his asylum case, but the government detains him and imprisons him for two years while he's litigating his case. Eventually he wins it. Now he's a lawful permanent resident. Amadou Jouf was an IT, is an IT specialist from Senegal. He was arrested with a small quantity of marijuana. It was really pretty obviously a driving while black kind of stop. Um, he was married to a US citizen, but still spent 22 months in immigration prison before he too won his case. Then there are others who are lawful permanent residents at the time that they're taken into immigration uh, custody. They call it permanent residence, but it's a misnomer because you can lose it if you're convicted of a crime. This is Alejandro Rodriguez. Although I remember the first time I went to meet him in the San Pedro detention facility, I said, say I'm Alejandro Rodriguez. And he said, what? Call me Alex. Because Alex was brought to the US at the age of one. He was no angel. He had had problems with the law. He had a joyriding conviction at the age of 19. Then he had become a dental assistant and had kind of turned his life around, had a child. But then he was convicted with a mis misdemeanor drug possession offense at the age of 24. Um, he didn't have any prison time as part of that sentence, but right from the, the courthouse, he was arrested by ICE and taken to the immigration prison 
for him to fight his case. Of course, he did everything he could to keep to, to keep his right to stay here, wanted to be with his kids. And he's a complete LA guy, he's a total Laker fan, actually. Um, and he had a very good argument that his conviction was not deportable. But he spent three and a half years in immigration prison litigating that and actually missed the entire first year almost of his of his baby's life. As it turned out, they were in some ways lucky. I don't want to say that. I mean, they weren't lucky. It was a horrific thing that they all went through. But the only reason that we know about their stories is because they happen to have lawyers, in all cases, actually immigration lawyers, to represent them. And as a result, they were able to get in contact with us, and we were able to represent them. And that made them very unusual, because nearly all people in immigration prisons do not have lawyers. Um, from 2007 to 2012, a study was done so by Professor Inger Daigley um, at UCLA Law School, who is now my colleague. 86% of the people held in immigration prisons were unrepresented at their merits hearing, the hearing where it really came down in their case. I'm realizing now I missed a tidbit from the last slide to tell you, Alex Rodriguez also won his case, he was able to retain his green card and is living in Southern California. So <clears throat> what we see from this is really quite a striking anomaly. Under the law that governs people given, given lawyers in the uh, criminal legal system, a punishment that can result in even one day's incarceration cannot be imposed without counsel. That's under the rule of Gideon v. Wainwright and then the cases that came after it, including Argersinger v. Hamlin, which just establishes the modern rule. But on the immigration side, the government deports tens of thousands of people every year without counsel, even in asylum cases where they fear for their lives, like in Ahilan's case, even if they're long-term lawful residents, like Alex Rodriguez, or even if they're children. And that's the law, and it's the law still today. Now, how do you change something like this when there are decades of doctrine built on a legal fiction? For me, what I was sort of taught and what I've, for the most part, practiced is the way you do it is you try to find the spot of greatest irrationality where the fiction, the legal fiction, is most clearly in tension with the lived reality of your clients and present that to the court to force them to sort of push, to push on the legal doctrine as it's previously existed. And that's what we sort of tried to do when it came to appointed counsel. We focused first on people with serious mental disorders because even they, in theory, <laughs> were supposed to represent themselves in court. This man here is Jose Franco, as in the Franco program for legal representation that Luis mentioned at the introduction and his parents. He was brought to the US at a young age. His entire large family lives here. Most of them are citizens or lawful residents. Um, he, though Jose was different from his siblings in that he has a severe cognitive impairment. He does not know his birthday. He can't tell time. Uh, he was arrested when he was a, uh, a, very, a young adult for throwing a rock at someone during a fight. And he pled guilty after that um, though, interestingly, his attorney did not sign the plea, and although I never got to talk to that attorney, my guess from having been a public defender myself is that perhaps the lawyer thought that Jose probably wasn't competent to understand this plea, which he certainly was not, but maybe he would get out sooner if he just signed it rather than being sent to some place where they would attempt to restore his competency, which couldn't happen because he has a cognitive impairment. But if that's what they thought, they were wrong because after completing his sentence, Jose was sent to an immigration prison for deportation proceedings. Now he was taken, unlike a lot of people with mental illnesses during that time who would just get deported, would just waive their rights and get deported. Jose, when he was taken in front of the judge, the judge did not like what was going on. It was very clear that Jose could not understand the proceedings. And the judge said, I'm not gonna proceed against this person without an attorney. Well, the government, for their part, they said, well, there is no right to an appointed attorney, so that's fine, but we're not going to do anything about that. And so the immigration judge administratively closed the case, basically took it off the calendar. But the government refused to release Jose, and so they sent him back to the detention center with no active case going on um, for him. And that's where he stayed, at the San Pedro Detention Center in Southern California for the next four and a half years with no active case pending. It was literally the gulag. 
Jose Franco remained imprisoned just like that. And actually it was only discovered, <laughs> I say discovered, because the detention center San Pedro was then slated to be closed. And it was slated to be closed. An immigration officer went through all the files in there to look at different people and they found Jose and discovered and thought, oh my goodness, what has happened here? And actually that uh, deportation officer called Talia Aylander, <laughs> an attorney at public counsel, uh, who then in turn reached out to us. And we all together agreed to represent Jose. Um, you know, after that, even when we wrote a letter demanding that his release, that, that he be released, they refused. <laughs> after four and a half years, they still refused to release him until we sued. And then we sued him and argued not only, excuse me, sued the government on his behalf, arguing not only that people like that, that he himself had to be released, but also that people with serious mental disorders need to have legal representation appointed to them by the government so they can get fair hearings in court. Which we sued, I think, on a Friday. The Monday was a public holiday, President's Day, I believe. And Tuesday, they let him out, which was amazing. It was a fantastic day. But then the government used that to say, oh, well, this case is moot. Um, there is no systemic problem here. Judge just dismissed the whole thing. Unfortunately, we defeated that motion. We defeated it and then spent the next three years litigating whether people with serious mental disorders have a right to appointed counsel when they're facing deportation. And eventually, after many hard fought years, we won. Uh, we won and the court declared that there was a right to appointed counsel for people with serious mental disorders. It was another truly, truly sweet day. And afterward, we made a video about that, which I'm now going to play for you. Mi nombre es Maria Franco. José Franco, él, él es mi hijo. Lo, lo, lo tenían allí, ya no lo tenían porque era porque por causa, sino que lo tenían allí sin darle no le daban cortes ni nada. Yo le pedía a Dios y le pedía y, ay, ayúdame, ayúdame. Dios mío, ¿qué, ¿qué es lo que yo puedo hacer para que mi hijo venga conmigo? Qué gusto. No hay algo que hacer. Del gusto que yo tenía. No, no hay algo que hacer yo de, de la emoción, de la emoción que me daba. The government did, um, in the end, extend that program nationwide. Uh, <clears throat> it's called the National Qualified Representation Program. Uh, it applies not consistently in every place around the country, but it does apply uh, in a number of states beyond just the Ninth Circuit where we sued. And it survived the Trump administration, which is sort of remarkable. After winning Franco, we decided to focus on what we perceived as the sort of next most irrational aspect of the no appointed counsel rule which was that it applies to children. And so we developed that suit in 2014. And it just so happened, I mean, that was just the year we won Franco and kind of decided to move on what was to what was next. Um, but two, four, 2014, of course, was also the year when a huge number of children started to come here because of massive state breakdown that was happening in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, a phenomenon that continues, as I'm sure everybody knows to this day. Well, we filed that lawsuit um, challenging the fact that the government was not giving lawyers to all those children in July of 2014. And it was that this came at the height of the Obama administration's hysteria around these children who are coming here in large numbers. I still remember both Vice President Biden and President Obama making in different contexts statements basically saying, don't come, don't come. If you come here, we will send you back. We filed a class action, a class action, arguing that these children had a right to appoint a counsel. And at the outset of that case, in particular, I spoke to a number of children you know, for the lawsuit. And in a couple of cases, I ended up staying in sort of longer relationships with them, which were very rewarding. Um, two things particularly stick out for me. You know, one is that for anyone who takes the time to actually talk to these young people, 
it quickly becomes completely obvious that children, and not just little ones, cannot hope to understand the immigration court system. Now, I asked a 14-year-old girl who we'll call GMGC, she was one of the plaintiffs in JFM, she had the misfortune of being the niece of a police officer in El Salvador and really faced very extreme threats to her life. I asked her, as part of the intake interview process, do you have permission to live in the United States? And she said she did. And so then I asked her, really, what, what paper, do you have a document that will show that? And she pointed me to the notice to appear, which is the charging document that says, you do not have a right to live in the United States. You know, the other thing which really stuck out to me was, you know, although they were sort of uniformly confused about the legal system, young people sometimes have a way of bringing like a clarity to what seem like complicated problems to adults. And I'll never forget the story of JEFM himself. He's a 10 year old boy and he had been brought alongside his 12 year old brother and his 15 year old sister here. And the guide, the coyote, whom their family had paid to bring them to the US had brought them to a spot along the trail and said, you know, we can go this way through the desert and you might get through without getting caught or you can go that way to the port of entry where you will be safe, but you will definitely be caught. He said this to, um, you know, the sister and uh, DGFM said, you know, she looked at her two little brothers and she just really wasn't sure that they were going to make it through the desert. And so she told the, coyote, the, told the coyote, go to the port. And that's what happened. That's how they got caught. These are sort of the choices that children make in these situations. And it was really hard to, to hear them and then to think that our government was not reacting to that with compassion. Well, to be honest, even that little bit is hard and it still gives me PTSD to tell the whole story of JFM, which I will not do. You know, the stories of the clients and the story of the litigation itself. Suffice it to say that we lost. <laughs> we lost and never ultimately won a right to appoint a counsel for children. But in the process, we did probably protect a good number of children because I think we made the government much more hesitant about enforcing the law. And we definitely learned some interesting things along the way. For example, at one point, I got to take the deposition of the assistant chief immigration judge in charge of training judges, training immigration judges on how to handle children's cases. And so I asked him, how old does a child have to be before they can represent themselves in immigration court? And this is what he said. Oh no. One second. Let's try that again. This is what he said. It must be true that there are some children that are so young that even if they receive the notice and even if they're given an explanation by the judge, they're still not going to understand what's going on, right? It has to do a case by case determination. I, I've taught immigration law literally to three year olds and four year olds. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience. Um, they get it. Um, it's not the most efficient, but, but it, it, it can be done. I can still barely believe that that actually happened, <laughs> but I was there and, and it did. I nearly fell out of my chair when I heard that answer. But if we thought about it in retrospect in an odd way, I suppose it really shouldn't have surprised me because what other answer could he give? You know, if he had said, yes, of course, if you're 10 years old, then you can't understand immigration, or 12 years old or eight years old, any then the government would have had to start actually protecting children at that age, which it was not going to do. Well, when we weren't getting a lot of traction in our case, we decided to build an advocacy campaign around that statement in particular. And uh, we made this video, which again, I'm gonna try to play for you. Elma, what country are you from? Uh, the red country. The red country? New York, little folks. Do you know what a country is? Are you afraid to return to your home country? Such a stupid, stupid, stupid thing from 
from a judge or anybody else. Yeah, I'm hearing some conflicting responses here. Do you have any evidence that you were born in Israel? Oh, no. You know, in retrospect, this is, by the way, among other things, a great record of some toddlers of the ACLU staff <laughs> during this time period. Um, and at the time, it was the most successful social media posting in the ACLU's history. It got a lot of attention. Federal legislation was introduced. As you can see, there were Senate hearings, multiple attorney generals, not to Eric Holder, and then Loretta, Loretta Lynch were asked about this. Um, but we didn't win. The Ninth Circuit and JFM essentially told us to file another lawsuit. Um, and I won't bore you with this endless procedural history, but you know, all of these cases that are on the slide here are cases where we argued that children were entitled to appointed counsel or could not be deported without lawyers. By the end, I myself personally had argued for appointed counsel for children in front of 16 federal judges over the course of at least six different oral arguments. Um, my co-counsel Stephen Kang argued the last one at the bottom there, but we never got a binding ruling on whether children needed lawyers to get a fair hearing. Um, and this issue too, like so many of the things in this presentation, has taken on a new urgency. At the Biden administration, on the one hand, they put appointed counsel in their day one immigration bill, um, but that bill doesn't look like it's going to get passed. Um, and in the meanwhile, the administration has recently admitted several thousand unrepresented children who have been stranded at the border. Um, into the United States. Those children, some of whom are now awaiting reunification with their families, not too far from here. In fact, there are some at a holding facility in Long Beach. They have all been charged with being deportable. They have dates in immigration court, and they are not guaranteed a lawyer. We had a little bit more luck getting incremental relief, challenging another irrational aspect of the immigration prison system, um, which is that many people locked up for years, as I've mentioned so many times, can't even ask a judge to be released on bond. You know, even if they have very strong defenses to deportation or very compelling situations, if they've lived in their house down the street for years, if the law says you're subject to mandatory detention, you can't even ask a judge to be released on bond. Earlier, I mentioned Alex Rodriguez, right? Well, in his case, the relief we sought was extremely modest. Right? Just bond hearings where imprisonment exceeds six months. That's always, you've been locked up for six months and your case is still going you really should have a right to ask a judge to be released. And we won that. We won that in 2012. And since then, thousands of people have been released under that rule. It's given a lot of people hope. Um, but, you know, as often happens, when you win a really good ruling in, in the Ninth Circuit in particular, the government tries to get it taken up to the Supreme Court. And that's what happened here. Um, that's me on the left in front of the courthouse steps uh, the day before, I believe, the first Rodriguez argument. And this here in the middle is our Rodriguez team. It's a spectacular mix of ACLU attorneys, academic clinicians, and law firm attorneys working pro bono. And it's really important to remember there's many paths that one can take coming out of law school, and there's no sort of exclusive rule that only one or the other um, is going to allow you to do good work. Well, <laughs> If it ended up, oh may no. I, may I ask you just a couple more? Um, let me just do that again. Um, sorry about that. I ended up arguing the case uh, twice, actually, because the first time I argued it was after Justice Scalia had passed away. We were in front of only um, eight justices. And then they set the case for re-argument. I had to argue it the second year. And that was after Justice Gorsuch had been appointed. And uh, the way it works, you get to go and watch if you want, and I did each time. I went the day before my argument to watch the Supreme Court just to get a sense of how the justices are thinking. And that day before the second argument, which is just the second day that Justice Gorsuch was on the bench, uh, there was an immigration case up there called DeMaya, which is about um, a deportation, whether a particular deportation law should be deemed unconstitutional because it was too vague. And here's what Justice Gorsuch said. Mr. Newman, yeah. may I ask you just a couple of quick questions? Sure. Or I hope they're quick. Mm -hmm. um, first, getting back to the standard of review and the distinction between uh, criminal and civil. Um, this court seems to have drawn that line based on uh, the severity of the consequences that follow to the individual. But that seems to me a tough line here to draw because I can usually imagine uh, a misdemeanor who may be convicted of a, of a crime uh, for which the sentence is six months in, in jail 
or hundred dollar fine. Um, and he wouldn't trade places in the world for someone who is deported, deported from this country pursuant to a civil order, or perhaps the subject of a civil forfeiture requirement um, and loses his home. So how sound is that line that we've drawn in the past, um, especially when the civil criminal divide itself is now a seven part balancing test? Did you hear that? I was like, whoa, whoa. What did he just say? He said, you wouldn't trade places in the world with a person facing deportation. It seems to me that he's saying deportation should be treated like a punishment. That was exciting. Well, the next day was my argument. And Justice Sotomayor asked some very hard questions of the government, kind of along similar lines, although this, of course, was about detention rather than just deportation. Listen to this. Let's answer this question. In which ways is immigration detention different than criminal detention? I mean, I, I understand right now that when you detain aliens, you put them in orange suits. They are shackled during visitation and court visits. They are subject to surveillance and strip searches. They are referred to by number, not by name. So in which ways is immigration detention different than criminal detention? Well, I think let's answer this. I was like, man, she's good. Can you just do my argument? <laughs> I mean, you hear that? They're wearing jumpsuits. You refer to them by number, not by name. And again, her position seems to be quite radical, right? She's saying immigration detention is prison. After the argument, I honestly thought, not just me, a bunch of people in our team, I think, thought that we might well win. Um, we really thought we had a good chance in Rodriguez. But about two months after the argument, we learned that Justice Kagan had actually had to recuse herself. And it was just really hard to find five justices for us um, amongst those who were left. Didn't help that Justice Gorsuch found that there was no jurisdiction in his view that we should have brought the claim some other way. And so in the end, when Rodriguez came down, it was a split decision, 3-2-3, three, three, with Justice Kagan recused. The majority rejected all of our statutory arguments as implausible, so our arguments that the statutes permit bond hearings in this way, but remanded back to the Ninth Circuit to consider the constitutional question. That is the question, is it actually constitutional to lock people up for this long without giving them a bond hearing? The majority said nothing whatsoever about that. So after more than 10 years of litigating this case, I found myself back in district court negotiating over discovery issues, talking to our expert, and making the same constitutional arguments for bond hearings 13 years after we had started. You know how I felt when they say, if at first you don't succeed, right? That's like me right there, except without those abs and, you know. <laughs> so that's sort of where things stood with the immigration prison population actually at an all time high when, well, when everything changed when the coronavirus struck. And for most of us, really fundamentally changed how we think about safety. You know, it brought on, obviously, the most horrific disaster of my lifetime, um, and I think the lifetime of anybody watching this. Now, I still haven't even begun to process the fact that, that 600,000 people have died in this country from that disease, so many of those deaths being preventable. And it turned out that what we really needed for safety wasn't more border patrol or police, as much as what we needed was public health infrastructure and the support necessary to allow people to stay away from work if they worked in crowded indoor places. Well, in the 15 months since then, of course, so, so much has happened. It's the reason we're doing this on Zoom. But although I think it can feel trivial in that context to even be talking about immigration enforcement, the human rights issues that preceded the pandemic still remain. And I think it's really important to think about what changed and where we come now when it comes to immigration, detention, and deportation. So this graph here, again, I, I put this uh, version of this slide up much before. It's the average daily ICE jail population over the last five years. But now here I've broken it down much more uh, from 2016 to 2021. You can see what happened. It reached an all-time high, 51,000 under President Trump and then just fell off a cliff. 
and you can see it just dropped down. We saw the lowest ICE incarcerated population totals in more than 20 years. In February of 2021, February 2021, just after the election or the inauguration, it was 14,000 people on any given day, down from 51,000. There's a bunch of different reasons for this. The Trump administration closed the border is a big part of it um, under Title 42, as I mentioned before. So the people coming in to seek asylum who were being sent to immigration prisons, that stopped. But they also radically decreased interior immigration enforcement um, because of the shutdowns um, from coronavirus. They stopped doing that kind of enforcement. In addition, there were a number of lawsuits filed to protect jailed immigrants during the pandemic because ICE detention centers were extremely dangerous places for the spread of coronavirus. One of the most important cases of those actually was filed by the ACLU of Southern California by my colleagues um, at that time um, in the office. And those cases forced the administration to release people during this time. The combined effect of these trends was to highlight what we already knew, that we don't need this awful and extremely expensive system of imprisonment to keep us, keep us safe. In fact, it only undermines our safety. But at least so far, in my eyes, that, that message does not seem to have reached the Biden administration. Look at the end of that graph. As vaccine spread and coronavirus deaths have slowed, the ICE detention population has started to increase once again and to increase fast. It was more than 24,000 as of this past month. So where does this leave us? Where does the story leave us? You know, I think the immigrants' rights movement is in a better position to resist expansions in the immigration prisons under the Biden administration than it was under Obama. And I think that's primarily true because the movement has been become much clearer in its message on the subject. For the most part, the advocates are really clear about what our North Star is when it comes to immigration quote unquote detention. We believe in liberty for all. We do not believe in imprisonment without trial. And so we must completely end immigration detention with no exceptions. And the advocates have been really forceful about that. And I think that has helped. At the same time, there has been less clarity, I think, about this set of ideas that you see in this, in this uh, post or uh, banner. Should there be any deportations at all? And I think a different question from that, should there be quotas on who can come to the US? Which is what I think of as the question of, um, one version of whether we should have um, an open border, but it would not be an open border. It's just whether people have to be checked in or should there actually be an open border, like the, say the border between California and Nevada. You know, similarly, you often hear people say abolish ICE. It's a huge slogan in the movement, but I don't think there's a ton of consensus on what exactly it is that that means. And on those issues, the movement still has a lot of work to do toward reaching a consensus and then describing it. Because in my view, we'll never make the change we want to see until we can clearly articulate what that change is. And that's part of why earlier this year, I left my beloved ACLU after almost 20 years to start a new Center on Immigration Law and Policy at the UCLA School of Law. Because I want to work with other people at UCLA and elsewhere to create a space where we can help to foster these ideas and hopefully have the hard conversations that are needed in the movement so we can get clarity on what we believe. Also, I hope to use it as a way, of, just as we did at the ACLU, but I hope it's not another perch from which to use it to tell more stories, like the stories that you've seen today. And I would encourage lots of people who do this work, your students, lawyers, advocates, whoever, to tell your stories. Tell the stories of your family. Tell the stories of your clients. Because I think those things really, they, they, they really do matter. And the last thing I'll say, you wonder, right? Will it work? Will all the theorizing, organizing, storytelling, policy advocacy, litigation, will any of it be enough to finally end these oppressive systems? I believe the answer to that is yes. And I believe we will see it, at least a lot of what I'm talking about, I think we'll see it in my lifetime. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And that's not the reason why I do the work. You know, I do the work well, to explain it, I feel like I draw inspiration from these words of Mahatma Gandhi, right? He spent decades peacefully advocating and eventually winning one of the greatest struggles for human liberation in the history of the world. And he said this, he said, it's the action, not the fruit of the action that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power. It may not be in your time that there will be any fruit, 
but that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may, may never know what results come from your action, but you know that if you do nothing, there will be no result. Thanks very much. And I guess the last thing I should say is many thanks to Jackie Delgadillo, formerly of the ACLU, Lee Chia, still of the ACLU, and Laura Elbaum from UCLA School of Law for assisting in the research and construction of these slides. So with that, I will stop my share and see what is in the chat. Grace, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, I'm trying to think about how we want to, or do people have, maybe people just want to write questions in the chat or in the Q&A? Well, there is something. Uh, right yeah, now. there's one in the Q&A right now. If you, did it pop up for you? Looks like. Yeah, right. I see it. <clears throat> I see it. Does the question, does the current standard for mental competence interfere with the right to counsel for those that suffer from mental disorders or disabilities? And um, thank you, it's, it's an important question. Um, let me give some context to it and then answer it. So, and the answer to your question, by the way, is yes. Um, so the way Franco was um, litigated, what we said was that if you have um, a mental disorder that is so serious that you can't be deemed competent to represent yourself, uh, then you're entitled to legal representation to do that task for you. And we litigated that way because we thought that the most likely basis on which we would win would be the due process clause, because there's a lot of prior cases on appointed counsel in the civil context, and they have gone off on the due process clause. In fact, even pre-Gideon, the cases that built to establish the right to appointed counsel in criminal cases were also due process cases. It was only Gideon itself that made the move to the Sixth Amendment. And so when we litigated the case, we focused on competency, because that was the frame by which the due process clause cases um, uh, sort of framed the issue. But actually, we ended up winning on this narrower theory, which we also advanced, but we didn't think was going to be the one that we were going to win on when we first started the case, which is the disability discrimination law theory, which focused on the fact that uh, it's under the Rehabilitation Act, which is basically the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act for the federal government. And that theory is just a person with a disability uh, is in need of an accommodation, just like if you, you know, do not walk, you need a wheelchair for a ramp up to the courthouse. Um, and an elevator rather than stairs, so too there's a set of rights that people are given in the immigration context, including the right to present your evidence, the right to examine the government's evidence. And if you have a mental disability that makes it, uh, uh, it sort of makes you unable to do that, then you should be entitled to an accommodation here, a lawyer who can help you do that. Now, under that theory, it shouldn't really turn on whether you're competent Right? It should really just turn on whether you have a disability so that you're entitled to an accommodation. And I think if we had litigated the case knowing at the outset that we were going to ultimately win on that discrimination theory, we would have adopted a much broader definition of what counts as a mental disability enough to trigger the right to a lawyer. But we didn't. And um, you know that's the reason why the injunction is written in such a way that the Franco injunction that um, it's really quite narrow. And, and in practice, we've seen this in, in the way it's implemented. There is a lot of people who have mental disabilities, who clearly, I mean, to me, sort of a common sense test, um, are obviously not um, you know, in a position to understand the immigration law and to, to adequately represent themselves, who are found competent and go through the, the process without giving, being given a lawyer. And I think the other part, uh, sort of part of the picture of that is that the truth is perfectly competent people and adults um, are obviously unable to understand the immigration system and represent themselves in immigration court. And so I think judges sort of struggle with this in a way, you know, they have this mental disability frame, but they know that obviously this could also be said of people who are perfectly sane and competent. And so they sort of struggle with how to reconcile that. Other questions? I think um, if there aren't others, I'll just say, um, oh, <laughs> what recommendations do you have for people interested in pursuing immigration? Um, 
Well, I suppose it depends on, um, you know, sort of where you're coming to it. Although in general, I would say, and this is something you've seen a, a flowering, particularly during the Trump years, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, if you are a communications person, if you are, um, you know, a religious worker, if you're sort of, I feel like regardless of sort of where you're, um, you know, what you sort of bring to it, there's a lot of work that can be done in all kinds of different ways um, to advance immigrants' rights advocacy. Um, you know, one example I'll give you is that there's a group known as the, the Innovation Law Lab um, out of Oregon in Portland. Um, them, and actually it's not just them, it's them and a group of, um, of other organizations started a program where people could go and volunteer and go down for a few days. Obviously this is before coronavirus and work as volunteers um, uh, to help represent people who are being held in the family detention camps in Texas, in Carnes and Dilly, Texas. Um, and they actually started this in Artesia, New Mexico in a place before they managed to close it down. And they were getting people from all kinds of avenues, you know, just, you know, all different kinds of people going down there and finding ways to put them to work. So I think, you know, so the most interesting thing I would say, the, the sort of first thing, threshold thing I would say is reach out to organizations that do this work. There's Families for Freedom is a, um, excuse me, Freedom for Immigrants, actually Families for Freedom do, but they're, um, I believe in the East Coast, Freedom for Immigrants is one that I know really well. They do visitation and uh, different kinds of advocacy to people who are um, detained. Um, I'm sort of hesitant just to name any one group and then kind of um, leave off others. But if you Google immigrants' rights advocacy, another one is Mijente, which is a, um, a superb organizing um, entity that does a lot of um, uh, publicizing of the um, stories of immigrants who have been impacted. If you're interested in particular people from um, particular communities, the Haitian Bridge Alliance does really fantastic work with the Haitian community, which has been particularly um, I think, uh, targeted for very intensive enforcement for a long period of time. Um, yeah, there's a whole, you know, lot, lots and lots of different organizations. There's a group called Al Otro Lado, which works actually binationally with people coming to Mexico from all around the world and also Mexicans. Um, it has offices both in sort of Southern California and in Mexico, um, but there's tons and tons of others. I'm sure I'm leaving lots of good ones out. Of course, the ACLU has a very vibrant um, membership and volunteer network, which includes an ACLU does so much good immigrants rights work. Here comes them. Um, will SCOTUS eventually take the view, will the Supreme Court eventually take the view that immigration detention is a criminal penalty? You know, it's really interesting because um, there is a move now, obviously the Supreme Court has become much more conservative leaning, actually more conservative leaning than it was when I argued Rodriguez the first time in 2016 by a good bit. Um, and uh, so, you, you know, you might think like, it's not a good environment to be immigrating, to be litigating immigrants' rights cases. And I think in general, that's true. I mean, you've seen, um, there's been some very harsh decisions, uh, certainly the Trump v. Hawaii case, um, in my view, both deeply wrong um, on the law and also really sort of, um, sort of inhumane and um, quite, uh, they put their blinders on and refuse to acknowledge the history of what had happened. So many things wrong with that. There's another case, actually a Sri Lankan Tamil man's case called Thursingham v. DHS, DHS v. Thursingham, which is a huge, um, <clears throat> I thought, uh, very, very um, uh, both bad decision. Again, I think very wrong on the law, denying people the right to get um, into court and habeas petitions um, <clears throat> when they are coming in the border region and trying to um, say that the asylum process has treated them unfairly. So certainly, in general, going in the wrong direction. That being said, uh, there's also a move, and it's a move amongst uh, many uh, people on the right of the sort of legal spectrum to see a lot of administrative penalties as um, significant enough that they warrant greater due process protection. I mean, that's what you see Justice Gorsuch doing in that case to Maya that I mentioned, he's saying, um, and, and in his view, you can see in his opinion, it's not just deportation, it's other kinds of civil sanctions too. He thinks, look, if the government is taking away, certainly they're deporting you, but also if they're taking away your professional license, if they are seizing your property, there's a bunch of things where maybe you don't get the full panoply of jury trial and all that, but you should get a lot of procedural protection because the government should not be able to do that stuff very easily. And I think if that 
were applied, that kind of thinking were applied consistently, there's no question they would see deportation as punishment. Deportation, excuse me, uh, immigration detention as punishment. Immigration and deportation as punishment, I think both of them, because immigration detention is prison. And there's no question, as he said, that so many people would trade, would gladly, gladly trade uh, time in prison if it meant avoiding deportation. Um, so I think that's that's definitely like sort of in the ether, figuring out how to get it in front of the court in a way um, which is sort of procedurally kind of proper, um, and at the same time done in a way which is responding to all the massive humanitarian needs that there are in the immigration um, kind of world is tricky. Figuring out how to get it there is tricky. There have been a number of immigration detention cases after even Rodriguez that have been um, there was another one actually also litigated by um, people at the ACLU, Cecilia Wong and Michael Tan, did this case called um, uh, Prayap v. Nielsen, um, where again, the court refused to decide the constitutional questions. Um, so they sort of ducked it a bunch of times, just like they ducked children's counsel. You know, I said that we never won that there was a right to children's counsel, and that's true, but we never lost it. The court never said there isn't, that children can do this by themselves, that they don't need a lawyer to have a fair hearing. Um, they just avoided the question. And so I think that's the that's the trick on that issue. There's a question about um, about a Sri Lankan Tamil from Miriam Young about um, a Sri Lankan Tamil man who had crossed the border in Texas. Um, who was in detention in Georgia for a year and then was got out on bond and now lives in the DC area and is still waiting for his asylum hearing. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have, I mean, I represented a, a several of them, but then in other contexts have been called so many times by Sri Lankan Tamils um, detained all over the US. <laughs> there were several that I represented who were detained in Florida, some of them got deported. Um, there's a number of times I've been called for people in Texas, um, in the far south in California, um, uh, in Imperial County, in Otay Mesa, in Arizona. Um, and I think this speaks to something very basic, which is true not just of Sri Lankan Tamils, but it's true of people from around the world. You know, if conditions are bad enough, people leave. Because, I mean, I remember um, when I was growing up, like, what are you going to do? Really, you're going to just sit there and stay there and let your family um, potentially get killed or even just starve, you know, forget the, for, forget the, um, you know, if there's political violence, um, you know, that's the reality, people move. And that, for me, it's the, it's, the lesson of, it's the lesson of the Trump administration. Family separation, the most horrific detention conditions, everything that you could imagine, they threw the book trying to stop people coming here from Central America um, in the face of these massive social breakdowns that were happening in these countries. And they failed. I mean, even after the family separation, it's a huge, um, uh, very large numbers of people coming. It just sort of spikes, goes up and down. There's very large numbers of people coming from those countries during the Trump administration. So this, you know, don't come, we'll send you back, all this sort of deterrence, like, it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work. And, and I know certainly from people coming from Sri Lanka, I think it does change what country you go to which is not so much an issue for people in Central America, but I think it does, if you're coming from other parts of the world, potentially change that. But a lot of times, you know, Ahilan Nataraja, he thought he was going to Canada. Um, in other cases, they actually don't even know. They're not even sure where they're going. Um, they just know they need to get out. And the smugglers are say, saying that they can take them to someplace safe. So I, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that people could learn if they um, really had the chance to be exposed to people who, who flee who flee their countries. Yeah, this, Miriam is um, telling a very sad story, a very common one. If you if you read the <clears throat> the so so um, the brother of the person she's um, she was talking about was abducted in a white van, and that's a thing in Sri Lanka. Um, the government uses white vans. They sp spread terror when they kind of drive around and they disappear people and duck them in white vans. And one of the things that happened in that case that I mentioned at the end, DHSV uh, Thursingham, was that um, he was trying to talk to this border official and explain his case. And he didn't say, I was persecuted on the count of my race <laughs> or ethnicity by the government of Sri Lanka because he didn't know anything about American immigration law. But he said he had been abducted in a white van 
And in that context, if you live in Jaffna, um, everybody knows what that means. Actually, if you live anywhere in Sri Lanka, everybody knows what that means. Um, but American immigration officials often aren't going to know and understand that context. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important for people to have legal representation so they can take the time to really draw it out and understand what the person, what the asylum seeker is saying. I guess for those following along, so the last thing I'll say about that is, although that person, Mr. Thursingham, lost his case in the Supreme Court, um, he actually, um, there's a footnote in the opinion which says, uh, maybe, maybe they should reconsider this case because it does seem like the persecution pattern that he suffered is similar to that that is suffered by other Tamils in Sri Lanka. And after a very intensive set of advocacy um, that I and others at the ACLU at the time did, um, and also that some Tamil human rights groups did at that time, um, it actually worked. And Mr. Thurisingham was given um, an, a new um, screening interview, which he passed and is now also awaiting his day in court. Well, thank you all very much for, for listening. I really enjoyed that. And, um, and best of luck to all of you uh, in, in your journeys in immigration law and elsewhere. Thanks everyone.